All right, so now it's being recorded. Again, thank you so much for joining today's webinar. I hope you'll find it useful. I hope you'll find some great insights on how financial controls can help your construction business. Let me first share my screen and outline what will be the main topic for today's discussion. Um, can you just let me know if you can see my screen with the presentation? Yes, you can, perfect. So the topic for today's webinar would be how to build robust financial controls for businesses in constructions. So it's a quite an important thing, especially right now when we have all kinds of different technology, all kinds of different challenges going on, and we need to try and to understand what is the best solution and how to find the best path in that very challenging market. Let us first introduce ourselves. My name is Alex Kesselman. I'm a solutions engineer here at Approvalmax. And today with me, I have a very special guest. It's Phil Marinkovich. Um, CFO at BMI Group. Feel over to you to tell us a bit more about your experience and what do you do in the business. Sure, yeah. Thank you, Alex, and thanks for having me. Excited to be here today and share a little bit of what I know. So um, as Alex mentions, I'm the CFO of the BMI Group. We're a real estate and venture development company based out of a town in Ontario, Canada called Tilsonburg. It's a bit west of Toronto. And as uh, Alex and I were just discussing before this call, uh, we uh, specialize in industrial, uh, residential and commercial uh, development, as well as hospitality property operations and ventures that are typically associated with that real estate. And uh, our projects are spread around mainly Ontario and Canada now, um, uh, but uh, spread around uh, northern and southwestern Canada in terms of those industrial and residential commercial mixed use developments. Great. And as a rough, you know, I guess order of magnitude to give folks an idea, I think we have a couple million square feet of industrial space under management. We have about a thousand residential commercial doors under construction in the next uh, two, three years. Um, we've got about a hundred units of operating long and short term residential and commercial rentals and um, a number of ventures, like I mentioned, usually associated with our real estate, but to do with logistics provision for tenants, um, you know, operating those properties, those sorts of things. Awesome. It's great having you here. But we also would like to learn a little bit about you guys, those who are uh, right now in silence, uh, who's watching this webinar. So I'm going to run one little poll just to understand who are we talking with. So let me just... Put the poll. You should be able to see that on your screen. So if you're just for us to understand if you are already an Approval Max customer or not, so we will know what is what is going on. All right, perfect. Half already. Oh, we have a very nice split between yes and no. last couple of people we got to get those nose down alex <laughs> again 50 50. well it's not really a webinar to sell a problem max it's more about to hear about the construction industry so i'm happy to hear happy to see that a lot of people here are already using the problem max and they know the benefit of it Though I see that a little bit more than a half is not yet customers. So hopefully after today's session, you will become a customer for Promax. So let me end the poll and let's move on to the main topic of today's webinar. And let's talk about the challenges and uh, what is going on within the construction industry. I have totally forgot that we have a second poll. It goes right after that. But let me actually run this one real quick just to understand a bit more about you guys. So we found out that, mm -mm, where was that? So this one. So now just to understand, who are you guys? Accountants, bookkeepers, small business owners, in-house financial professionals or other, whatever that means. Okay. 
just a few more words, but we see that the majority of our audience today is bookkeepers and small business owners. One person who said other, let us know who you are. I wonder. All right, I think we can, st we can stop the poll from here. Majority of you already answered who you are. Let me end the poll and let's go to the main topic of today's webinar. So speaking about the accounting challenges in construction companies, Phil, I want to ask you a question based on your experience. So can you describe some of the financial challenge challenges that, that the construction industry companies are facing right now? Sure, yeah. So, and to, you know, be a little pedantic to parse a little bit what you're saying. So the accounting challenges stem from, I would say the financial challenges more broadly and the financial challenges, which, you know, judging from the folks that are on this call and, and the different things that they do are probably familiar with is, you know, it's always been a challenge in the construction industry in terms of speed um, and accuracy and let's say rising costs or, you know, cost changes, let's say. But um, in the old environment, that last variable in terms of costs tend, tended to go one direction, which was up. And so as bad as that was, um, there was still a certain predictability because you knew which direction things were going. Where I would say the major difference, at least, you know, speaking for the region that I'm familiar with here and kind of, you know, the Northeastern US, uh, Eastern Canada, but I'm pretty sure it's, you know, true in most places, maybe even globally these days, is that element of cost is not only more volatile uh, and fluctuating than it's been, but it's also unpredictable. You know, rising costs, lowering costs, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just added a new dimension, which, you know, beyond the old world, um, you know, we might be familiar with some tactics in terms of, you know, delaying sales and kind of strategizing your pre-sales or sales if you're doing you know, condo type units or, um, you know, similarly different strategies in terms of buy and hold, you could kind of wait out um, some of those pressures. Now there's just, you know, uh, more variability to those variables, let's say. And so when it relates to the accounting stuff, it's really um, being on top of administering those changes as they're processed through your organization and your operations mm -hmm. such that, those ultimate accounting decisions can be as quick and painless as possible. You're referring mainly on the operational side of the things or more on the strategic side. So it's like more of a forecasting into the future and it's hard to predict what's going to be tomorrow in a couple of weeks and days, or it's more about procurement process and just trying to understand what is going on on the market right now. So exactly. Yeah. I'd say a little bit of both. So I'm in terms of, you know, existing projects, uh, I'm referring to procurement, you know, where, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's just very unpredictable right now, um, in the kind of trade markets where the prices will be on any given trade. Again, you know, in the industry, as I'm sure we're all familiar with on the kind of forecasting budgeting side, you know, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of kind of, you know, um, market costs per square foot for this or that, that you can use to kind of benchmark things. And again, in the past, it's just kind of generally been known that across those categories, things tended to go up. There might be, you know, pressures with certain trades given, you know, just project volume in the market and those sorts of things that might affect pricing, usually to the upside. Um, but now we just find it's ourselves in where, um, you know, I'll give you an example then, outside of procurement and acquisition, in Ontario, unapproved greenfield land is more expensive to buy per area than approved projects with permits in hand. Why because is that? It's flip side because, because of that variability and folks not knowing where the market is. And then of course you layer on, you know, softer demand and sales because of interest rates and so forth that plays into that overall strategy with your sales. Um, folks are kind of just pushing the button to say, we'd rather spend the next couple of years creating value in a project in a slower and steadier way. And we're talking about now like developers and constructors, which we're both. So we do both the development, you know, planning approvals and the uh, general contracting of these projects. But um, there's just to say that like where those 
the money that's gone into those, for example, in a lot of trades, we see the prices coming down now, in fact. And so it's becoming sort of like a timing question the opposite way where where can you catch the optimal prices in the trades in a softer supply market, right? And so it's a little bit of both things. So on the procurement side, like I said, there's a lot of testing the waters and uncertainty in terms of where the market really is. And so it just requires that nimbleness with your overall budget, because of course in construction, you know, there's a lot of gray areas, overlapping trades, those sorts of things. So, you know, when you're tendering or doing your um, RFQs, you know, and you're kind of vendor to vendor comparisons, you'll want to make sure that it covers the same things. And so as you're going through that and kind of like administering those different POs and contracts and so forth, you just want to be, like I said, that much better and more accurate and faster at um, capturing those things, just given that there's that much more variability in the overall market that's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then let's say from your experience, if we'll split this into two parts, one is operational, the other one is a strategic. How is your in, in BMA group, or maybe if you're talking with other leaders on the market, how do they overcome such challenges? Yeah, I mean, do you mean, well, specifically on the strategic operational side, it's, you know, mainly a question, I would say, of um, just your team's competency. I mean, there's no other way to um, cut it. I think that the market as it is now is putting pressure on development and construction companies to up their game, to be more efficient, um, to um, just be better at what they do. So there's no way around that. But, you know, as it relates to then, you know, how do you take that mandate and achieve it? It's via, I would say, you know, tools like Approval Max Technology is a huge one generally, I would say, to get your folks, you know, because I think a lot of particularly like smaller construction companies are kind of like on that tail end of the old world with pen and paper, and those sorts of things. But how can you start to transition your folks onto the technology platforms and into that kind of technology driven mindset that's going to get you that scalability and efficiency to compete in these tighter markets. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. And we will cover that in a moment. I have a couple of more questions regarding the tech stack and the uh, importance of the financial controls. I would like to run another poll right now to our audience, just to understand what are your challenges, just to see where we are standing and what grounds. So let me run another poll. Uh, um, this one I will share with you guys once the poll will be finished. Let us know what is your biggest challenges right now. Straight away, all of the above. <laughs> yeah, trust me, folks. Uh, can relate. It's funny to, to hear, especially when we do like an initial maybe a discovery call or showing the demo of the product, asking the customer, so what is your current challenge? What are you trying to achieve actually by looking at the different platforms, different solutions? And the answer is very commonly, well, we actually have challenges pretty much everywhere. We're just trying to resolve every piece somehow. We're kind of in a, in a wild forest, just trying to understand what is going on and what's there on the market. So I'm not very surprised by looking at what are we seeing right now in the poll results. All right, maybe a few more people. I see just half of you has responded yet just yet. Okay, so let me end the poll here. I will share the results. As you can see, uh, almost half of the audience have problems, have challenges with all of the above, with the duplicate payments, the data entry uh, errors, unauthorized purchases, and some people actually answered also other. Not sure what other means in that sense. So let us know in the chat section. I would be happy to hear what other challenges you guys facing. But now let me stop sharing, and we'll go to the next part where we're trying to understand how to resolve those things. So how can tighter financial controls help alleviate these issues? And one question that I have for you. So what are the key components of the robust financial controls in your experience? 
Right. So, you know, at the end of the day, financial controls, you know, distilling to maybe the top couple practical objectives, you know, as it relates to this context is um, protecting yourself from liability. So, you know, folks, let's say within your author organization, authorizing purchases or other activity that they shouldn't be. And really being proactive in terms of um, uh, your purchasing, which is, you know, the main sort of function covered, let's say by approval notice, right? And so, and, and that's like the one to focus on and it kind of ties into depending on where we take this conversation, you know, how to use approval maps, what are the, you know, main things you want to look for in terms of implementing these financial controls. But the bottom line is that you want to create those either incentives or disincentives, whatever is more applicable, um, at the right moments in your company's process, in this case, procurement process, to compile the right data required to make a definitive judgment on that thing that's under consideration mm -hmm. and then once that decision is made that it kind of like ensures that all every you know all the ducks are in a row and that everything subsequent to that decision being made is kind of like empowered to happen so like a common one right you know in terms of speaking for us um you know one of the first things that approval max alleviated was basically work starting without po's being issued and it took a lot of time now, granted we're a large organization. Um, you know, we have about 70 ish employees, 50 plus projects spread around, you know, the province sort of thing. So it took some months and, and those things to like get under, get under control. But, um, you know, in our case, that was the most important, the first critical gate that we introduced as part of financial controls and that, you know, and, a principle I always apply in terms of my kind of like, you know, process analyses and those sorts of things like the 80 20 rule that change. So 20% of our financial process changing just that, just that procurement piece in terms of PO approvals to get everyone onto the system um, had massive benefits downstream because now, to my example before, it was made that workflow is set up such that once that PO is approved, it's necessary that, you know, all the stakeholders in that decision or align with that decision and there's no hiccups or obstacles after that in terms of performing. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of see how like, you know, at the end of the day, you know, and judging by the, by the folks answering this call or, you know, answering the poll, you know, in construction, it's often like, you know, principle driven organizations, you're not going to issue payments that you're not familiar with. So it's not so much even maybe a like, um, you know, a fraud or a payment kind of like liability thing. It's more, how can we as an organization really use financial controls to become really culturally more proactive as an organization, but that'll necessarily require us streamlining our finance and admin so that those decisions are made kind of in the right order. So for me, financial controls really, of course, as the CFO and thinking in terms of accounting principles and fiduciary duties and all those sorts of things, that's like the ultimate mandate is to be in line with, you know, those, you know, requirements, but um, in terms of, you know, then relating that to the organization and implementing it with the team and so forth, it really has more to do with aligning the team to operationally make decisions in a streamlined way. It's actually interesting that you mentioned that because one of the answers from the chat that I can see right now from Christine, and she's answered other, because one of the biggest issues is having site staff and supervisors stack their expenses built to the correct projects. I think it's kind of relates to what you have just said. A lot of people, yeah. a lot of companies, they kind of misunderstand and mis cannot really see the whole picture of what everyone is doing, cannot really align that to the operational and strategic goals of the company. Yeah, so I can directly to, you know, Christine's point. So, you know, Christine, what we do internally um, is kind of really segmented in three ways. One, uh, we tend to run our projects as individual entities in QBO. So there's, you know, 
less risk of miscoding that way since you know requesters are could can be different for each company although the same requester can apply to multiple companies then further within the companies we use both qbo projects as well as qbo classes primarily classes since they apply both to the pnl and the balance sheet in terms of categorizing those things and then in approval max the nice thing they do is within their workflow uh, management matrix um, you can actually restrict then which gls classes etc individual requesters can code to so for example our construction folks can only code to the construction related gls on our balance sheet um you know our uh you know pre-construction team can only code to the development division and that sort of thing so um that's also the sort of thing which and, you know one of the points that I would give to this, you know, even though it wasn't asked is like, when you're implementing these financial controls at the outset, the most important thing in terms of like the first version of whatever you implement is just that everyone uses it. Don't sacrifice the perfect for the good. You just need everyone on a system and, you know, with the lowest common denominator as the standard for them to just start using it. And that's, for example, what we did with approval max, but the lowest common denominator was just to deploy it with each project and have everyone, you know, submit their requests or approve to submit requests only to the correct projects. And then as we've gone and refined responsibilities and accountabilities, there's features in there to more granularly control. Okay, they can request for this or that, or if a request goes for in this GL, it should go to this person for approval, et cetera, et cetera. And then over time, we've refined that. But the first step in your journey, if you haven't started that already, I would suggest is just to get everyone onto a system. And in this case, I would suggest that if you're using QBO and you're looking for a system that can kind of like be your master system for procurement or your primary system for procurement, which kind of contains your entire record of POs, your entire record of bills, and then that ties into duplicate matching and those sorts of things, then over time, you can start to refine those. So ease of use and scalability, that is like one part of the, of the whole process, something that you're looking at at first. Is there anything else that you're looking at when you're selecting a new piece of software, some advice maybe for people who are watching us today of how would you proceed with adding additional systems and what do you look at and how do you build your app stack? And actually one little additional tricky, tricky question, what is your app stack? What other apps you're using for the whole, for the whole system, in, if, if that's possible to say? Sure. Yeah. So our app stack is uh, pretty simple in terms of organization wide. Um, it's just really QuickBooks Online, um, Approval Max, and um, and uh, we use a program called Asana for kind of our task management. And then our different departments and divisions um, might have more um, you know industry specific software that they use, or you know our construction team uses construction software and that sort of thing which has some other functionality uh, in terms of, um, you know, uh, drawing coordination and those sorts of things. So that's generally our app stack. App stack. Um, and then, you know, yeah, I mean, to your question of um, choosing them, I think that's exactly it, which is, you know, everything rolls into finance and with smaller companies, especially the financial team, you know, bookkeepers, accountants, and everyone else will have an outsized role, I think, in terms of uh, engaging with and really kind of like directing the activities of operations. And so it's empathizing with operations folks that they're not financial folks. I mean, we take, you know, looking at a balance sheet or whatever for granted, and it's, you know, so easy. Why can't everyone understand it? And so, you know, usually when you're a smaller company, you're not going to have like a purchasing system or other systems that are way removed from your finance system where, you know, it's coded into your GLs in a way behind the scenes by an implementation team. And so someone's using some, you know, interface and have no idea where that's like landing in your financials, you know, with smaller companies, you tend to deal more closely with the financials and the operations folks tend to be closer with the financials. Um, you know, so when they're going in, even into approval max and submitting requests, um, you know, unless you have products set up for all your entities, they'll likely be choosing, you know, categories or GLs to book to. And um, that's also got to be done in a way that's intuitive for them. So it's not only that you're, you're kind of like financials are set up in an intuitive way for your 
operations team to understand. But then the other softwares that are tying into that, which tend to be more financially oriented, like an approval max. The nice thing like an approval max is it is very intuitive for folks that aren't finance and admin first. And if you're kind of clever about some of the ways that you set up, you know, your QBO. So for example, you know, if folks are familiar with, you know, um, commercial rental properties, let's say you have this component of TMIs, taxes, maintenance, and insurance, which is recovered from a tenant, right? So for our ops team, and you'll usually have in your PNL one, you know, account for the recoverable expense and then another account for the unrecoverable. Well, we go in and very explicitly, you know, where we have, let's say, a repairs and maintenance GL on the PNL, we'll very explicitly go, you know, TMI dash repairs and maintenance for the recoverable one. And then for the other unrecoverable one, just have repairs and maintenance or unrecoverable repairs and maintenance. So that when that person on the front end, which then we further restrict, let's say, and only let them, you know, request stuff for the PL if it's an operating property, because why why should, you know, why would they be requesting stuff, you know, that's capitalized, that you know, there's no capital works that they should be involved with? Well, now you've empathized with them, you provided them a platform that's, you know, mobile first, intuitive kind of like, you know, you know, kind of your, you know, typical kind of like online SaaS platform design um, that then again, if you're clever and empathetic with how you're setting up your actual financial data is very easy for folks to use. And again, the number one consideration is just to get folks to use it. Even if the version one of whatever you're doing is like, Hey, just send me an email that you've requested this service. Don't have, you know, maybe version one doesn't even require POs. It's just like, let us know, just so we know that someone has done this. And then you can kind of move on from there. Yeah. It's funny you've mentioned the ease of use and how, how easily is it to, bu to build all of these workflows. One of the very, very common questions we receive during the demos, like, so how many weeks would it take for us to build a workflow? And it feels like people are so tired and so frustrated with all of these different softwares out there, which is super hard to implement, super hard to build. Because in April Max, it actually takes maybe an hour at max to build even a very complex workflows. Especially if you have a little bit of experience, it might take even a couple of minutes. But we'll keep it aside. In a moment, I will be showing the product demo like very briefly. I have one more question before we'll dive into the product demo. It's mainly about the future. In your experience or by in your opinion, what do you think would be an upcoming trends and what upcoming challenge that the construction company industry construction industry companies might be facing? Is there anything you can see straight away or right, right now, or is it all going to be all the same? Yeah, no, I think it's um, exactly this theme that we're on. I think that you know the construction industry has been. Uh, I know there's a term for it. It's like it's like construction tech or con tech, or I don't know what, but, um, or build tech or something like that. But, you know, it's been flirting with technology for a while. Uh, the folks on this call will probably be familiar with, you know, a couple of the bigger names that have some softwares out there for managing projects, although they tend to come with like very heavy price tags. So sort of restricted to uh, the larger projects. So it's kind of been flirting with that. And I think it's just in a moment now with, um, you know, largely, just the interest and the cost pressures that are out there. Efficiency, you know, more than ever is at that sort of premium. And so I think, you know, in the next while, it's all about um, construction technology, uh, as far as like the materials and those sorts of things go. Um, we're toying with some of that now. And, you know, the, also the prefabrication and that sort of thing. And then in terms of, you know, the workforce and the sort of like admin management, just really, simple tools like an approval max that slides into your operations with minimal friction and sort of like future proofs or you know scale proofs your future proofs you in a way where it just starts that process like you'll naturally you know once you know you just have that first version and you get the ball rolling it's funny like you know with any sort of system thing, folks kind of like resisted at first, but then once they see the benefit of it, and especially if you can make it seamless where it's just substituting something they're doing now with just a more efficient way of doing it. And they see that benefit of, for example, not having to follow up via email for approvals, you know, it's just an approval max or 
asking questions about a PO or a bill, not having to call people around, but leaving a comment, you know, or a person going on site, taking a picture of something and uploading it instead of like emailing and then getting lost. Yeah. It's just those little things I think are going to get captured or can easily be captured with this technology. And folks are, I think more willing now to look at those and adopt them, you know, specifically like the operational teams. And I think that, you know, when cumulatively, there's massive efficiency gains to be gotten there. So it's somewhere between, I would say, like building material, building technologies and building materials. And, um, and um, really, I think uh, it just, you know, construction is, is primed, I think, for, a, for just like a, a level up in terms of its, you know, technology adoption. Yeah, so it's pretty much like almost in every industry, a tech and the actual industry is now synthesizing in one big thing. So one without the other is pretty much impossible. Tech without the actual other industry just would be something for geeks, but the industry without the tech won't be able to succeed in these ever evolving markets. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for these answers. So right now, what we'll do, I won't go very much into the details in terms of the product demo. I really don't want to overwhelm you with all kinds of different features. We'll just take a basic look at the, what is uh, this platform is capable of. So let me just put the slide on. How can Approval Max for QBU Online help you? And let's dive in straight into the product demo. So straight away, once you, if you'll decide to give it a try, and I hope after this webinar, you will try to, uh, you will decide to give it a try. There's a 14 days free trial, which will allow you to play around with all the available features. So then you can make decision for yourself if this platform works for you or not. Once you'll create your account, what you will find it's all of these different QuickBooks Online approval workflows. Once you will connect that to your QuickBooks Online organization. One thing about Approval Max, that first of all, none of your users those who will be raising purchase orders or approving their bills or expenses, they don't need to have access to your QuickBooks Online account. So you can create like a special, uh, like a shield between your accounting platform and people who will be using that. And then within these workflows, you can build a smart process of where each and every PO or where in each and every bill or expense should be going to based on the different rules. So if we'll take a look on the purchase order workflow, for example, we'll see that it now looks like a blank canvas. That's where we can start building the approval process for our organization. Moreover, we can add as many organizations under the same umbrella account. So then you'll have instant access to all of your documents in just one single place. The way it works, it's quite simple. Left side of the screen, it's all about the different ways how we're going to create our documents. Simply select everyone who's supposed to raise purchase orders within your organization. And just like Phil mentioned, you can limit your users to very specific things. So if you'll take a look on your requester matrix, you will find columns which represent data from your QBO account, such as a list of your vendors, such as your product and services, categories, locations, classes, and so on. So let's say to Allison, I would like her to only work with a class that matches R&D and only for our London's office. So I can easily select specific, specific parameters for her. And I can do that for each and every person from my team. Once I've established the requester matrix, I can move to the right side of the screen and that's where I'm building my approval steps. Beauty of Approval Max, as I've mentioned previously, that you can build a very complex workflows in just minutes. So you don't need to be a geek or a nerd to understand the way it works. You don't need to even need to have a technical background. It is very straightforward and very visual. You just click on the plus sign, it creates an approval step for you. So let's say I would like my purchase orders to go through two approval steps. At first, they should be approved by the relevant regional manager, or maybe location manager. So I will call that location manager. And then if the amount of the purchase order is greater than maybe 100K, it should go to our CEO. So I will call that CEO. But in case you need to have more approval steps, you just click on the plus sign once again, and again, and again, you can drag them whenever you need to. So it's a very straightforward process. Once we have our approval steps, you simply select who should be your approvers. So let's say, John, Marie, and myself will be under location manager step. And for the CEO, let's say it will be Peter and it will be Vivian. Again, just like with the requesters, I will go into my approval matrix where I will define what these guys can see and what these guys can approve. I have an addition, some additional columns, such as my total amounts and the requester, so I can build my workflow based on a variety of these parameters. For the sake of our example, for the sake of our time, 
let's just say that all the purchase orders that were raised by our from our Sydney's office should go to John. If it's coming from our New York's office, should go to Maria. And if it's coming from our London's office, should go to me for my approval. However, if the request is greater than 100K, then it should go to our CEO. So I will select a rule. If it's over or equal to 100K, then these guys should be involved in the approval process. Moreover, I can create some additional alternative rules. For instance, Peter might be approving not only everything that is over or equal to 100K, but also if it belongs to the category code, maybe advertising. So he's our CMO. While Vivienne, she will be approving everything else, which does not belong to the category code advertising. So I will create the rule category code does not match. And just like that, within two, three minutes, we've built already, well, it's quite a simple one, simple example, but you get an idea. Easily, you can add more and more layers on top of that structure, and you can build a workflow of pretty much any complexity for your specific business. And once it's all ready, you just simply activate the workflow, and you're now set to go. You can now start raising your purge orders all within Approval Max. So for users, they have a couple of different options. First of all, they can just simply log into their Approval Max account, click on Create New Request, select which request they would like to build in case you have access to many different organizations. And it will take you to the form where you simply provide the details about which vendor you would like to work with. So let's say it's going to be a Pro Max. It will bring the data from your QBO account, which location you're going to work with, category details or line item details. So let's say we're going to purchase a Pro Max for QuickBooks Online standard. You can provide vendor message, you can provide memo, you can make an attachment that will be sent over to your approvers and later into your QBO account. So all of those things are available for you straight away from this user, user interface. Exactly the same process is available through our mobile app, actually. So in case you're on the go, but you still need to raise your purchase order, or maybe you're on your construction site and you need to create a PO, you can do that through our mobile application. For approvers, on the other hand, the whole process is even easier. You have four different ways how you can approve your financial documents. First way would be to simply log into your Approval Max account and straight away see from just one and first screen called My Decision Required, you will find everything that is awaiting your approval. So in our case, Perch Order to Approval Max came to me for my approval because I'm approving all the PEOs from London's office. So I will straight away see the details about the uh, items that I'm going to purchase in case I have any attachments, I'll be able to see those in full screen or in side-by-side -side mode. Here on the bottom of the screen, I can straight away see who is our approvers, where it will go to next. In case I need to communicate between the team members, I can use the commenting tool here on the bottom of the screen. So everything is available for me within just one place. I don't need to go to many different screens trying to find what is exactly awaiting my approval. However, in some instances, some people, maybe they don't want to log into their approval max account. Maybe they just want to see the details that are awaiting their approval, maybe via email. We have an option for that. So let me just open the request. Every time something is awaiting your approval, you will receive an email notification from us. You can configure those notifications. Don't worry in case you don't want to receive them every time something is awaiting your approval. You can just enable a summary of pending approvals and decide when exactly you would like to receive those notifications. But in case you want to receive these notifications, you will find already all the details about the request. You'll find links to your attachments. And straight from here, you can click on approve or reject. And this decision will be sent into your Pro Max account. Very straightforward. Third way, as I mentioned already, would be through our mobile app. So you will find all the same details as you can see it here, including attachments, including the commenting tool, including the approval workflow and the audit trail. And there is a fourth way. In case you're using Slack, we now have Slack application. So you can install that application and all the notifications will be sent into your Slack channel. You will be able to approve, reject, comment, see the audit trail, and all other details. So we made it super simple for you to manage your account, to manage your documents, so you never will miss anything that is important. And then once you're ready to approve your document, you just click on Approve. It's now disappears from My Decision Required, and it will be automatically and instantly synced back to your QBO account. So you will straight away find this purge order in your QBO, you will find there is a PO number assigned. You will find there is an audit report attached both here in Approval Max and in your QBO account. 
And these audit reports will show you who exactly raised this document and who exactly approved this document under which approval step. And later, in case you need to go through the auditor check, you can just easily take all of these audit reports and provide that to your auditors. There is, of course, goods received notes. You have for your convenience link that will take you straight to your QuickBooks Sign account. It will include already the attachments and the audit reports. So pretty much all the details will be instantly sent into your QBO account. So now you have a single source of truth, which is a Pro Max. You have all of your users and you don't need to pay any extra for user licenses. It's free of charge. And you can process as many transactions as needed all in one system. That is, in the nutshell, the way it works. Pretty much the same process will, apply, will be applied for our bills or expenses, but we can also add on top of that that we can receive our bills or expenses from Dex Prepare in case you're using Dex Prepare. Okay, so let me put the slideshow on. I have one more poll to run. I see that we're about to reach the time for our Q&A, and I see that the first question just came in. I want to run the last poll for you guys. Mm -hmm. Just for us to understand, if you would like to hear about us a bit more, well, I know that half of you are already using a Pro Max, therefore maybe le less relevant for you guys. But for those who are not using a Pro Max just yet, maybe if you would like to see uh, maybe in, a bit in-depth demo on the way it works, so let us know. It's always the most uh, frightening question, actually. You always assume that everyone says no. But luckily, we have a very good audience today. While you, some of you are still answering, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them all in the Q&A or in the chat section of Zoom. I see one question just came in. So let us know if you have any questions both to myself or to Phil. Okay, so let me end the poll and let's go to the final slide, which is the Q&A. So one question that we have here from Natasha, uh, is there any way to exclude the possibility of the same person to approve PO on multiple steps for s and compliance? Great question. It's, I think it's the question for me mainly. Yes, you can. Uh, there is a special setting within your approval max account where you can select that person should be approving all step at once or it should be approving each time where his uh, approval decision is required so if the person is in under different steps we will ask you what you uh, the way you would like to proceed with that that is something that you can find in the settings for each and every workflow Uh, Shari Robins Robertson asking, how does Approval Max help with duplicate payments? It's a good question, especially if you're working with, let's say, with Dext, or maybe if you're just creating bills within Approval Max. We, if you have exactly the same bill that you've sent for approval, we will flag you. There will be a special warning that, hey, you previously sent this bill for approval, and we will show you the link that will direct you to that bill. So then you can compare one thing to another and make sure that it's if it's a duplicate, then you can just reject that. Or if it's not, then you can just proceed with the actual approval decision. But yeah, thank you both for these for the questions. Any other question, guys? All right. Seems like we're all good. In that case, first of all, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Phil, for being with, with me here today. And thank you for your insights and great understanding the way the whole market works, what are the challenges and how do you guys resolve those challenges? Um, yeah, I, it was a pleasure having you all here today at the webinar. I hope you'll have a very nice day and you will re receive a link to the recording exactly in 24 hours. And you will also find that later in, in YouTube. Have a lovely rest of the day and bye-bye. Thanks, Alex.